where I spend my Saturday mornings these days, hosting community radio shows. But back in 1939, this ethnic community radio station was in the heart of Montreal's Jewish neighborhood, just east of Mount Royal. It would take a war to end the Great Depression and provide jobs for everyone. And we were really a refugee family from Russia that had left there, I mean, without anything at all at the time because of the pogrom. But now when you look at the environment that we had then, you see, a relationship between what we called landslide, you know, little groups of people that we were paraded on Sunday to visit and everything else. We didn't have cars, we didn't have uh, other transportations and stuff like that. We didn't need it because we'd walk three or four blocks or 10 blocks. I remember going to La Fontaine Park from uh, Park Avenue, or St. Urban Street, that is, and we walked both ways, and that was an outing and a picnic for all day. And we weren't, of course, far from Fletcher's Field, and my mother was working, and she'd meet us in Fletcher's Field after school and bring us supper in Fletcher's Field many, many times. We borrowed money uh, to buy a beer and grocery store and the hours were horrific. And it began to affect my heart. And when I went to the late Dr. Siegel, he said, take a nap in the afternoon. Get yourself some kind of easy chair and sit in the back of your store and, and nap. Because I also had a, a fellow who, uh, who looked after the store for these people I bought it from who worked for me. What shall I tell you? I napped, he stole. You know? So, in the end, we came out owing a lot of money. So I went to work for my cousin, Charlie Rothman. Rose dress. And as they say in Yiddish, Chabnish Gilek Ken Honik because I used to do the payroll. I helped the bookkeeper and do the payroll. And they used to punch in, you know. And a card or two were missing. The, the girls didn't put them right back in the, in the, whatever they had on the wall for the. He came in one day and he says, where's that card? And I said, what card? And he says, you know what card? You know, he says, you, you were a socialist, you are a socialist, you, the labor movement, you know, I, I suspect you. I, and he walked, he ran out of the room. I started to cry, and when I came home, he said to me, don't go back. He says, you go back, you don't go into work. You sit on the bench, you wait till he comes in, and you tell him, if you don't trust me, and I don't want to work here. That's exactly what I did. Oh, oh, go back to work, go back to work. So I went back to work. You know, but it wasn't, it wasn't easy times. Times weren't easy, but the youthful spirit and idealism of the immigrant generation was still dominant and infectious. Uh, there was a, a great sense that there's something terribly wrong and that we should be looking for different ways of organizing our political and social life. I think uh, we all had were influenced by the communist viewpoint, by the liberal, by the socialist uh, viewpoints. And uh, I think for us who were um, in the middle class, so to speak, uh, there may very well have been a romantic aspect to this because we were looking for an ideal world, which probably will never be, but to which we aspired in, in any event. Uh, so I don't think it was uh, we were in the same position as people who were, say, uh, working in a shop and fighting for uh, better wages and better working conditions, where their political expression was a very immediate, a very tangible, 
uh, one which expressed itself in action. Well, I was a red diaper baby, Stan. That is, my parents had been active in the Russian Revolution, uh, and uh, I was nurtured from early childhood on uh, to look upon Lenin as the great savior of women, the great savior of children. I mean, my mother was a participant of the revolution. The thing about Lenin was women got their place, Jews were emancipated, so this was really the hero. And, uh, you know, this was mother's milk for me. Well, the minute I knew him, he was going to become an engineer. The, from the first time I met him, you know, and I was going out with a medical student at the time. Can you imagine a Jewish family at that time to have a boy who wants to marry your daughter, who is a medical student, who is going to be a doctor, yeah. to a fellow working in a garage, as a mechanic with dirty hands. My mother was a very smart woman. When I came to her and I said, you know, I'm torn, I don't know what to do. So she said to me, look, my daughter, you do what your heart tells you to do. Never mind about money. You do what your heart tells you to do. Then I really had a problem. Our concerns when we were 13, 13 to 18, to the time that we were stuck into the army, were where are we going to go bowling? Whose house are we playing poker in? Where are we going to go to eat after we've uh, had our uh, poker game? Uh, my father was a very militant atheist, and he had contempt for people who were religious. On Yom Kippur, he got himself a ham sandwich and he marched up and down in front of the synagogue on Duluth. With a glass of milk? No, he didn't have a glass of milk. Okay, that, that might spill. When I was nine, he took me into the synagogue on Simchus Torah. And I remember there wasn't enough money for apples. It was the middle of the Depression. So the kids had potatoes on which they put candles. And he said to me, Eri, this is Areket. I never want to find you in a place like this so long as I'm alive. He says, this is where rabbis make a lot of money, period was over. They tell lies and make a lot of money. Now, there were many like him. Now, I must say, <laughs> I did feel even then that some of this was a little extreme, particularly since it isolated me. Pesach. Pesach, we had to have bread, and we lived on St. Lawrence in Duluth, where my father had his photo studio. So I had to run down. There was no Jewish bakery open, obviously, but there was a stop and shop on St. Lawrence and Pine. So I used to run down there to buy a cracked wheat bread. But then I have to run a gauntlet back home. The other kids didn't like the idea of somebody buying bread, you know, and coming home. It was the first week of September 1939. Canada had just joined Britain in the fight against Nazi Germany. Irving Layton was an aspiring poet in his mid-twenties. Where was I when the war broke out? I believe I was still in Montreal at the time, yes. Because I remember uh, walking along uh, the boulevard St. Lawrence and the news had just come that the war had broken out and I didn't know how I was supposed to feel about it. So I was examining myself, I was palpating myself to uh, come up with what what am I supposed to feel now in the war? Because it's such an immense thing that you don't really know how you can feel about a thing as immense. Were you expecting it? In a sense, all of us on our skins were expecting something to happen. But just when was a bit vague. Before Jack Seutcher joined the army, he and many of his generation were already working in war factories. Uh, I, I just walked into Montreal Locomotive Works. You see? And uh, they, they were building at the time, or starting to build, the Sherman tanks. We started off with tank number three. The tank number three was built in the state, and this was completely dismantled. You see, and it was sort of made as the model, as the uh, die and everything else for uh, manufacturing of the tanks here in Canada. You see. And it took us about six months 
I would say, not me, I, I was really a kid at the time. But I was no more than 19, 18, 19 years old, you see. And we, we built the, the first tank, uh, it took us six or eight months. Sometimes we couldn't build tanks, there was a shortage of parts, a shortage of this, a shortage of that. And I used to go, I had a little fella, if I needed a part, once I needed a little bracket, so I go in the old locomotive shop and I tell him what I need, I showed him a sample. By the afternoon, he made me a whole bunch. You know? And I brought it back and that started the line moving again. Honest to goodness, it's a little piece of, piece of metal. And if that little fellow wanted to get him to have a part, he would go to my late husband. He would say, here's a piece of, of a part of a tank. Make a form that will produce it in quantity. Did they know each other? No, oh. but when he was saying you this, suddenly realized I know it. because when he was courting me, he was making all <laughs> sorts of little things that he turned into ashtrays or he turned into something else. He was a jig maker and he was the one, I'm quite sure, that made the parts oh, that's, that's that they needed for the tanks. And many went off uh, to, to work with their lunch pail and... Uh, Jewish women? Jewish women, non-Jewish women. They, they went to work. Remember that some of them had to had to had families. They had young kids. The government, you know, the, the, the army check that came in. I don't know what it was, but he didn't buy many. Uh, he didn't buy much bread with it. But I can remember also during the war years we were involved in where Pascals used to have their store on Park Avenue in Bernard. That was a big warehouse where we used to go in there and we used to help pack uh, stuff to send to the soldiers. Uh, soap and shaving cream and what have you, and we were in, that was our contribution to the war effort. I mean, what else could we have done? We we did all we could. We raised money. We worked. We did what we could. I mean, our boys went. Our boys joined the services, and uh, many, we we lost many many Jewish boys in the war. Melly's right. Everybody did. The volunteers at that uh, Red Cross on Crescent Street, they had it. It was the Ballon yeah. House, remember? And, an, and they, everybody volunteered. There were lots and lots of volunteers who worked there. And the hospitality for soldiers. And we rolled bandages and we made up parcels which we sent overseas. Yeah. And we, we knitted and we sold things yeah, and, uh, and we sent money to overseas, I think it was. Yeah. But we, we did all the, the knitting. I remember we knitted helmets socks for the soldiers and, and, and socks and, yes. and, and we used to climb the stairs, the outside stairs on Esplanade Avenue to canvas and get quarters and dimes from the people there. They couldn't afford more, but they gave. Some of the so-called uptown Jews were already secure and comfortable in Westmount, but they also sensed the coming war. You know, uh, both of uh, my grandfather's sons, uh, my late father Jack and, uh, and, uh, and Bob were in the service during the war. Uh, they had a different perspective than many, much, much of the Jewish community. I'm talking about how they lived because uh, they lived in Westmount. And in many ways it was a more hostile reality because until the war, uh, you know, there was a tremendous amount of, of affection in, uh, for fascism and, uh, and that, and uh, they had to, where there were maybe one or two Jewish boys in the class at Westmount High or in Roslyn School in the 30s and, uh, and what have you, uh, I think that it was a different perspective that, that, that one had, and economically their, their lives were better, but in other ways was more difficult because the world in which they lived was not particularly charitable or, or friendly to the Jewish people. So. Uh, I think that uh, you remember that, Papa, and... Uh, I remember it very and, well. And so... Uh, so it, it, you right. could live well in Westmount, but you could not escape some of the uh, racism that had been built up? Well, I think that... Um, that uh, uh, we never really suffered from racism at school. You were never called a dirty Jew at any time in school? Yes. Or something like that? You yes. were? Yes. Well, we were. Yeah. In the first years of the war, Harry Mayorovich was summoned to National Film Board director John Grierson to supervise production of Canada's war propaganda posters. 
one of them, I think one of the powerful uh, ones, was to indicate that in this effort we were all Canadians, that uh, race, religion, color, etc. had no part in this. The, the whole poster program, uh, I felt, had a, a wide range and was, I felt, socially responsible and universally uh, important. Well, uh, I joined the army because uh, I was a Jewish girl who felt that I, sh I should take uh, uh, take the job and, and release a man to go overseas to uh, shoot up a few Germans, you know. At the beginning of the war, right as the war began? Uh, it was uh, 43 when I joined. 43. Yeah. What was your family's reaction when they heard you were going to join? Well, my mother was upset. I don't think my father was. But um, I tell you, I went to the Canadian Jewish Congress to see if I could I was asked to do this, whether I could um, get more uh, Jewish girls to join the army. And uh, I was treated as though I was some kind of a prostitute <laughs> by these ladies who were uh, knitting socks for soldiers. What made you think, why do you think they did that? There were a lot of poor kids who came in there because they needed food. They needed to have shelter and food. And uh, there was, uh, uh, that was one of the reasons that so many of them joined up. And, uh, and some of them had been uh, walking the streets, you know. And they got it, it was a very bad reputation. It was at that particular point that they asked me to, tro to try to get some Jewish girls, because I knew the Jew <laughs> they weren't going to find all kinds of uh, floozies look, you know, among the Jewish women. Did you get any at all, or did they I didn't. Them? I didn't do too well. I got a few. I got a few. In the fall of 1942, I joined the Army. I went into the Ordnance Corps, where my services as an accountant were used by the government, by the Army. I then moved on to various different uh, jobs. Uh, I finally became an instructor in military training, Parade Square and rifle drill and uh, all the other uh, machine gun, Bren gun uh, training. And uh, then moved on towards the end of the war. I went to Vancouver to the Intelligence Corps to study Japanese for the Japanese theater of war. I wonder, do you have any sense of sort of regret that you never uh, were in a position to go overseas and, and look firsthand at what was happening? Well, that's putting it very charitably. <laughs> I, I don't know how else to put it. Yeah. I, I can't say that I had any regret because I had the chance uh, and I, I, I did uh, volunteer. I know that, yeah. You know, I didn't wait to be drafted uh, so that any time that they wanted to send me overseas, I was available. But they figured I would do more damage to the American or the Allied cause than I would to the Germans, so they kept me here. A very wise precaution, I'd say, on their part. Here on Craig Street, now known as St. Antoine, honest Harry Mendelssohn's pawn shop was a fixture on the Montreal scene. The son Joe has sharp memories of going to the Vigée Hotel to enlist, only a few blocks from his father's famous store. I went down there and I signed up. I went home, I didn't tell anybody. They told me to come to the Place Vigée Hotel on Craig corner St. Denny. We went there for a medical examination and I was had to sign papers and I took the oath 20 times. And all of a sudden the major came out and he yelled, Mendelssohn! I said, How the hell would he know me? 
You're, Mr. Mendelssohn, you're here against your father's will. Because I was 19 then. I was born in 1920. He says, your father was here and he objects, so go home. So I said, I can't go home. I signed my name about 10 times. Don't worry, I'll look after that. And I went home. I then went to the Air Force and signed up at the Air Force. I didn't tell anybody. We were told to take a toothbrush, I don't remember if a towel, and a bar of soap to the Windsor Station Friday night. My mother gave me a Shabbos meal and I said, Goodbye, Ma. She thought I was going out for the evening. And we took the train to Toronto. My father then went and saw a lawyer and tried to get me out. But this time he had a deal with Ottawa because I was already in Toronto. And from Toronto, they sent me to St. Thomas, Ontario. And he got a reply. We appreciate that you need your son to help you in your store, your health isn't, but the country needs him more. First of all, I thought that I had to devote my life to the revolution, that that was really the only course that I could take in my life. And I think that my mother sort of agreed with that. My father was not terribly excited about it, but she sort of felt it was quite an appropriate thing to do. So there were two things that were operating. One, that I was too young to uh, go overseas and get involved in the army. I was 17 when the war ended. But I did join the army and got thrown out because I was underage. My father pulled me out. So I got into the Merchant Marine. And the way I was able to get into the Merchant Marine was there, the Canadian Seamen's Union was a communist-led union. So through a guy called Jack Shaw, who was the business agent of the union in St. John, New Brunswick, I was able to bypass all kinds of formalities and get on a ship. The last year of the war in India, what were you doing there? I was a navigator flying in Liberators, where Ho Chi Minh was our great ally, and we were doing a lot of cooperative flights with his group. I went to Manning Pool in Toronto, where I, I was registered for a radar course. And uh, while I was doing basic training, I decided to remuster for air crew and went through all of the testing. and. Uh, in the end of it, everything was wonderful, except that my vision was too borderline and they would not accept me, accept me to air crew. So, probably, it probably saved my life, but that's beside the point. In any case, uh, I served on the West Coast. These isolation stations had about 30 or 35 fellows on them, and uh, some of them were quite dangerous in a way, because uh, every one of those radar stations in the north lost people into the, in the water because it was extremely dangerous water. And we had a chap who came up there and went out in a boat and we never saw him again. If I were younger, I would have gone overseas, although I had just joined as rabbi. But they were looking for younger people. And I joined up as a part-time uh, chaplain. And I had a lot of stations that I looked after and about three, four days a week, I used to visit these stations. The boys came to me also to have a little chat mm -hmm. and mostly to get them leave on holidays. <laughs> Were you able to do that? Oh, yes. <laughs> I was able to. I, I must say that we lived very, very well together with the other groups. My relationship with the Protestant chaplain, the, the Roman Catholic chaplain, they were excellent. As a matter of fact, when it came Hanukkah and Purim, I threw a big party for them in Lachine. What was the party? Corned beef and salami sandwiches. Ah. <laughs> I couldn't get the smell of corned beef out of my car <laughs> for weeks and weeks. Anyhow, we used one of the hangers. Oh, there must have been about a hundred Jewish boys. And I told the others, Listen, boys, we're open to everybody. I hope there are enough sandwiches. I don't care if you're Jewish, Catholic, or whatever it is. Come on, boys, all of you, have a good time. 
that was my work <laughs> as the as a chaplain in the in the Air Force. All right, ladies and gentlemen. I know you all think that I was a dancer. True, I joined the minstrel show as a dancer, but before I was a dancer, I want you to know that I was a boxer. And I was a Golden Glove champion. Some of you folks might remember me. I used to fight under the name of Kid Candle. Kid Candle, one blow and I was out. And what finally stopped you? Well, I got involved in the entertainment field. I became the Jitterbug Champion of Canada just at the time when Sam Miller was forming a troop show to entertain the armed forces at the beginning of the war. I've been in this thing a long time and a lot of people. And I go into the Cavendish Mall and I'm walking along and all of a sudden a man rushes over to me and says, Sam Miller, how are you? You look terrific, sensational. And just as he passes me by, I hear him say to his friend, I didn't know he was still around. See, this is life, eh? You gotta accept those things, eh? It was like a home away from home. Sunday was my whole day at the Minstrels, at the Y. The Y was a meeting place. Uh, I was in one show, Hotel Shapiro. I was the youngest kid in the show. I was their sweater girl. It was a camaraderie. Uh, meeting people and, and knowing them and if you saw them in the street afterwards you were friends it was like a big happy family now it's been 40 years since we've put on a show put us on a stage and you're gonna see how we go I'm singing hi minstrels why minstrels proud to be here glad to be here I'm glad to say hi When I was growing up, uh, we lived in the district, I think it was the federal district of Cartier. And it was, uh, there was a ferment going on there at all times. And I can still remember the days of uh, uh, RCMP on horseback, banging people's heads with their uh, clubs and uh, uh, demonstrations of that kind. I can still remember right outside of Barron being high school during an election some violence uh, and people were being piled on trucks to go and vote uh, in the right direction. Uh. In 1943, with sympathy for the Soviet Army's resistance to Nazism running high, Montreal's Cartier riding became the first federal district in Canada to elect a communist member of parliament. Right before the campaign started, with the Communist Party and the Stalingrad with them, and with the Liberal Party throwing everything in in the campaign with Lazarus Phillips, and the bloc populaire candidate Hébert being a real threat at that time, and their politics were really very confused. Would Lewis have had a chance otherwise? He thought he would have a chance. I got into the army, I don't know, you know? But it, I think of all the candidates, he was the best, was best candidate of the lot. It would have saved the Jewish community the, the, the embarrassment of a Fred Rose. Anybody who was in the movement knew that Fred Rose had, had links with the, with the, with the Soviet uh, security system. Not long after the end of hostilities, Fred Rose, in the climate of the Cold War, was convicted of espionage and deported to Poland. I think part of the thing, and this is pure guesswork on my part, was that the Jewish community obviously was sensitive to, let us say, and fearful of the Nazi, the rise of Nazi uh, activities. And I think that they, many Jews then would have tended to support someone who was a um, forthright anti-Nazi person. It was a very disturbing time because it was a very contradictory time. And uh, while many of us felt that the Soviet Union uh, was establishing or trying to establish under great difficulty uh, a new way of life, uh, that nevertheless we had our loyalties to our own country and uh, Fred Rose's role, uh, role then was troublesome 
and at the same time that uh, you could admire the fact that he was a man of principle uh, who was doing what he believed. There was a huge variety of opinions and everyone was seriously involved and I think that's the beauty of the time that people were involved whether it was things I agreed with or not you know uh, Zionism from the left to the middle to the right uh, and uh, socialism and Marxism of, of a huge variety the fact of the matter what was beautiful about it to me was that people were involved and they cared and in one form or another, there was a lot of humanism there. People cared what was happening to other people in the world. I was trained uh, to be a bomber pilot. Um, uh, I, I went through further training in England. Uh, uh, I, I was crewed up with a variety of people to, to be, become a, a captain of a four-engine bomber. Uh, my navigator happened to be a Jewish boy from Montreal. And uh, we, uh, we then uh, ended up uh, in a squadron, the 433 squadron, in the 6th Canadian Bomber Group, stationed in Yorkshire. And um, uh, from there, uh, we did uh, 35 uh, bombing missions uh, in a variety of places, ranging all the way from uh, the Bay of Biscay in the south to, to lay mines to try and trap German submarines going back into, the, uh, into their French uh, harbors. And, uh, and uh, also to laying mines in Norwegian fjords to try and prevent the shipment of Swedish steel coming down through the Norwegian coast to Germany, all right? And land too, you worked over Germany? And over Germany. Germany also as well as occupied, uh, occupied Europe. There. Every three months I had nine days leave and I spent the nine days in London. I used to when I was in London, the first time I went to London, I, w I went to sleep in a, in, a, in a Sally Ann place, and all of a sudden I, I'm, I'm tossing from side to side, and I said, well, what the heck's going on over here? <laughs> so the guy comes running in from, from the place, and he says to me, a V-2 rocket landed, didn't land near us, but quite a, quite a distance away. But it shook, it shook everything up, the ground and everything. They were one of the, one of the, mo the, the, mo the worst weapons, I imagine, that they had in that war. Well, next to, the, next to the atomic bomb, the atomic bomb was worse. While I was still a flying officer, uh, was the DSO, uh, which is awarded for leadership in the face of the enemy. That was a, uh, an attack by a part of my squadron, which I led against uh, an enemy convoy along the, the coast of Norway. The convoy was very heavily defended uh, and we encountered some very serious uh, defensive fire from the convoy. And we were also jumped by a squadron of uh, fighter, uh, fighter aircraft. And so I ran into a, uh, an encounter, a dogfight that lasted almost 20 minutes. Uh, at one point, I escaped and uh, got in, up into the clouds, but the, it was winter time and very serious icing conditions, so I had to come down out of the clouds, and he was right there again. And so I got involved in another series of turns and evasive tactics and so on until he finally broke off, and so did I. And I... Uh, as a Jew, knew that uh, I could not risk being taken prisoner because I knew that I wouldn't do very well as a prisoner, a Jewish prisoner in German hands. In fact, uh, as a wing leader, they had recordings of my voice, they knew my name, uh, and from uh, my wingman, who was eventually shot down and taken prisoner, my number two, uh, after I left the squadron, uh, he was shot down, taken prisoner, and he was interrogated. And during his interrogation, he was asked about me. He didn't tell me precisely what he said, but he told me that uh, because he came, came back to the squadron after he was rescued from POW camp, and he had been a very close buddy, and he was a Montrealer, a French-Canadian Montrealer, and uh, he told me that they had specifically asked about me during his interrogation. And uh, they wanted to know who I was, what I was, and uh, how come I was leading the squadron as a Jew. Uh, 
uh, he told them, they asked him if I was Jewish, and he said yes. A lot of Canadians, a lot of Montrealers particularly, and maybe even in other parts of the country, were get, take, getting jobs on American vessels. It wasn't only from the Manning Pool, and we heard about jobs from the, um, available in, on American ships. We took them, the, the wages were better. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So we weren't averse to, to sailing on an American flagship, and I did, and, and Panamanian ships, foreign flagships, as well as Canadian. It wasn't too successful a thing for a married person to support a family, but as a single person, fine. About a thousand young Jewish boys from German-speaking countries were deported to Canada, with several strange stops along the way. The Isle of Man, where they would be safer from the Blitz. A forest in New Brunswick. An available army camp in Farnham in the eastern townships. Many ended up in ile aux -Nois, a small island in the Richelieu River south of Montreal. Some stayed only a few days. Many stayed for as long as two years. They were safe from Hitler, but they were prisoners in Canada. And uh, this is the way we came to Three Rivers, where we were marched through the town, the people standing there and waving and shaking their fists. And uh, of course, they thought we were German prisoners. And, uh, then we walked up to, which I think was the baseball uh, stadium of Three Rivers. As soon as we marched in, these Germans they, that were there already recognized that we were Jewish and started to sing their Nazi songs. War at that time was going very bad for, for, for the Allies. Germany, uh, it was still before Pearl Harbor. England was fighting alone in spite of Churchill's words. Nothing happened actually, and the Germans were advancing, were advancing towards Mos Moscow. Leningrad was under siege, and we were afraid that any day the Germans are going to win the war and we are going to be sent back to Hitler. And that was later on Rosh Hashanah we got from the Jewish community. We got a shofar, we got from the Jewish community in Montreal. We got a, a lulav and a etrog, and just one of this. So we got books sent from them. So they knew that we were here. But I don't think enough was done to, to get us out from here. How did you occupy your time? In Illinois, they made parachutes. What did you do? I can tell you about Fellington. In the winter, uh, they even asked for volunteers to go and work in the bush and cut trees which was great fun, we enjoyed that. But partly because we got out of the camp, mm -hmm. uh, partly where, where this was new, all new to us. We were all urban types, you know, we'd never seen an axe in our life, you know. <laughs> in a way, that's where I became a sociologist, although I never knew the word. How did you make the connection? Well, the connection is that I just marveled at how this random collection of people recreated society. Some of the older people organized courses, you know, and uh, there was all kinds of activity going on, and there were jobs to have, be had in the kitchen and, and so on. When you say jobs, you don't mean jobs in which you got paid or you well, were given but, these chips. money. We were the first ones of a group, you know, of yeshiva students to be released. Uh, we were picked up in a bus. The Jewish community had prepared in the Young Israel, at that time the Young Israel was in Park Avenue. They prepared a nice, a very nice reception. They made a nice dinner for us. On that day there were speeches and the, it was very, very nice. And from there, we spent our first night in the, there was a Jewish orphan's home in Westmount. I remember walking my first walk in freedom in Westmount. It was a beautiful night, this, this uh, new snowfall and very clear weather. So this was a real, real release. You know, I was free, I felt free. The only thing is I didn't know at that time what happened to my parents, which I had left. In, in Germany, and uh, the last letters that I had in camp were very, very negative. They were driven out of their homes. They had to live in a communal home, and there was a fear that any day they might be uh, deported. So this was very much on my mind. So, uh, so on one way, I was happy to be released. On the other way, this worry was constantly on me. 
stayed that way for and a long stayed time. that way till I really found out that they were finally that they did get killed in the Holocaust. Rabbi Leib Baron, a yeshiva student in Vilna, was as concerned with Soviet atheism as with the Nazi threat. He convinced his co-students to escape with him, and with the invaluable help of Chine Sugihara, the Japanese consul in Vilna, who provided visas, they fled Europe through Russia on the Trans-Siberian Railway. After a brief stop in Japan, Rabbi Barron's group was able to get to Shanghai, China. The consul was a nice person, it seems, and he realized that we are in danger. I mean, they all realized that. They knew under the communist he and there's no rabbi, rabbinical students, you know. Siberia is the place for them. <laughs> it never happened to me. Did it ever happen to you that a person should get a visa not meeting the council, not being in the, in the, in the, in the consulate, not signing any paper, not filling out any paper? He just went with 300 visas and got, he got first the 300 Curaçao, and then he got the Japanese trans transit visa. To us, Sugihara is like an angel sent down from heaven, you know, to save our life. In Shanghai, I remember, we bought a house on Wayside Road, 118 Wayside, I still remember that. And summertime, the windows were open. And Yeshiva is not a university, you know, you study quietly and you write and you don't hear anything. And Yeshiva, you know, is like, you know, discussing and debating and yelling at each other. Then the, Chinese people used to pass by. They never saw it in their life. They thought it's a bunch of machine going there. What's going on there? Why are they yelling? Summertime, you know, the windows were open and yelling. You know. That's how we were there for five years in this place, for five years. After the war, Rabbi Barron was invited to Montreal to help establish a rabbinical college here. The Portuguese ship Serpa Pinto crossed the Atlantic with mostly Jewish refugees four times between 1941 and 44. The Lowy family had made their way to Portugal. After sending Frederick and Henrietta to safety in America in 1942, their parents, Joseph and Maria Lowy, boarded the Serpa Pinto in 1944. Halfway across the Atlantic, they encountered a Nazi submarine. Frederick recalls the children's voyage. We arrived in Philadelphia, took a train to New York, and then uh, stayed at, at an orphanage in New York uh, run by the Quakers, who then distributed children according to background Jewish children to Jewish families, Catholic children to Catholic families, and so on. Uh, we felt, of course, uh, sad because uh, we were away from our parents, but at the same time, um, always well cared for. And then the Canadian government did a wonderful thing. They said that all the parents of those children who had been on that particular refugee ship would be allowed to come to, Portu to Canada for the duration of the war. We, we all went in such good spirits. We would see the children again. Everybody was happy. And uh, I remember that uh, fateful night. There was dancing and music. And then everybody went to their cabins. And at uh, 2 o'clock, somebody knocked at our cabin door and told us to immediately come on board with up our life, on, uh, on, on deck, yeah, on deck, uh, with our life jackets. The captain told us that uh, uh, orders had come to sink the Serpo Pinto. We couldn't believe it because we knew that the Serpo Pinto was a neutral ship and had permission from both warring sides to go to New York. There was, we are no ladders into the lifeboats. We had to jump down. And I remember there was a young woman, highly pregnant. I was afraid when she jumps, there will, something will happen. But nothing happened, I understand. In Ottawa, she later gave birth to a happy child, a healthy child. You, you see here ropes breaking, breaking and people fell into the water. The cook, the doctor, and a baby died. Where We spent a whole night on the lifeboat rowing away, as did all the other boats. Fortunately, it was a calm night, but still water was coming into the boat and everybody had to bail out water. Everybody was seasick, also the sailors who were with us in the boat. I still remember a wonderful 
uh, sunrise. I've never seen something like that. The sun came out blood red. It, uh, but of course, everybody, we knew we couldn't go very long. And then um, in the morning, our captain, the Portuguese captain, who was a wonderful man, I mean, we, we learned afterwards, was on the U-boat and with a loudspeaker uh, announced that everything was all right and we could go back on the boat. So we went back. Yeah. Somehow the ship ladder had broken. We couldn't uh, get up. So some officers stand, stood on the, uh, on, in the open door and we had somehow to jump up. So, so you eventually made it. We eventually made it. Another group of passengers recalls 50 years later their reception on arrival in Montreal. They took us, if you remember, to, on St. Joseph Street to the Talmatora. Somebody did ask the fee of caches, and I remember distinctly that someone gave my brother and I each $5. Hmm. That's that unfortunate. How come you didn't split it with me? <laughs> because I know that you got and you didn't even tell me. <laughs> but I remember getting five dollars and that was a fortune in 1944. And each family had a place where to stay. Each family had a room. If it was a room or a double parlor, you remember on St. Absolutely. Urban Street, Every, everybody had a place where to go. We That's right. But I remember we stayed with a Mr. and Mrs. Flexer. He was the salt of the earth, head of the uh, Hatters Union. They had one son here, and one son was fighting while well, he was in uh, Britain, a paratrooper. And on June the 6th, we were here about five months, she got a telegram. He was one of the first ones to be killed, and I never forgot that. My, f my, my father, when he came to Montreal, he says, you have to kiss the ground. Because he says, here, I am not an étranger. In France, he would have been an étranger all I his slender. life. He I was, he was, he was. So would you as his child? No, 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 I was, no, because I was born there, I became a French citizen. But my father would never have become a French citizen. And he would have been an étranger all his life. He came here, he saw the opportunities and the people, and he says, you have to kiss the ground. My mother, on the other hand, was not very happy. My mother uh, was, uh, you know, was born in Warsaw, lived in Warsaw, then lived in Paris, big cities, came to Montreal, a f big, provincial town. All of a sudden, all her family was in Paris and she was in Montreal. And Montreal was cold and dingy. And she said to and she, and my father, and my father started a small business. And my father was very happy. But he made her, he, she made his life miserable. So he says, okay, Zlata, go back to Paris. We'll move in with the barrel. And, <laughs> and that's true. All summer I ate at his house. <laughs> And you will decide if you like Paris, then I will, you know. He would have been willing to. And willing to move back. She went back to Paris and she stayed three months just during the summertime. And she came back and she said, Yossel, we're staying here. much of a change as yet, except for the fact that some people didn't come back. Uh, and then very soon after, the, uh, some of the refugees began to appear. But to me, I don't, there wasn't much of a, I didn't have any perception of a difference. My friends that I had left were back, and we started up again where we had left off. 